Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we visit a battlefield cemetery in Caterpillar Valley. Situated in the southern sector of the Somme battlefield, this was a part of the front where there were Allied successes during the Somme offensive. We're first stop this afternoon at Caterpillar Valley Cemetery. Now the reason we've actually brought you to Caterpillar Valley is not so much about the cemetery that's here behind me. It's because of the vantage point we get of this battlefield in the southern sector of the Somme Front. Before I start you off on the activity you're going to do, it's worth talking briefly about how these cemeteries came to be. This morning we saw that little one tucked away at Hyde Park Corner at the end of the trench down in the fields. What perhaps should be called a soldier's cemetery created by the troops at the time to bury their comrades. The one we went to, that Y Ravine, with lots of the Newfoundlanders down in the park, was a battlefield cemetery, created after battle to bury those who had been killed. What we've got here is a little battlefield cemetery. If you look at the dates on all these headstones, these three rows that we've got here are all from the same dates, 26th and 27th of August 1918. After the war, they spent nearly five years going backwards and forwards across the battlefields of the Western Front, searching for the remains of the missing, finding the smaller cemeteries, the isolated burials, the soldiers who had been laid to rest in a shell hole, or those who had simply fallen on the battlefield. As they cleared the battlefield, they started creating what became known as concentration cemeteries, bringing together those individual graves or those tiny cemeteries into locations such as this one. This is one of those concentration cemeteries, a cemetery that is created after the war from graves from across this battlefield. My name is Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. It's the 7th of August 2018. I'm in the Caterpillar Valley Cemetery on the Somme battlefield. Caterpillar Valley is in the southern sector of the Somme battlefield, south of Thiepval and of Beaumont Hamel, much closer to the Somme River itself. The Somme River flows east to west through the southern part of the battlefield. And on the 1st of July 1916, it provided the effective demarcation between the boundaries of the British and the French forces. So the French are attacking south of the Somme and the British north of the Somme. In the original plan, the French had been due to take the major part in the battle. Their contribution is of the order of 40 divisions. By the 1st of July 1916, their contribution is 12 divisions. That's because they rotate divisions through the Battle of Verdun. As they do that, they're of course exhausting those divisions, leaving themselves less able to take the principal role in the Battle of the Somme, which falls to the British in numerical terms. The effect of the reduction of the French sector was to amplify their strength in local terms. They could concentrate heavy artillery more effectively here. They were fighting on a narrower front than they had anticipated. They achieved much greater successes on the opening day of the battle than did the British troops at the north and in the central sectors of the Somme battlefield. That success also benefited the British troops that were immediately adjacent to the French sector on the northern bank of the Somme. Those troops also got initial successes for another reason. Round here, it was left to each division in the British Army to make its own decision as to how it would implement its attack. In the area adjacent to Caterpillar Valley, there were divisional commanders who took the decision to move their men 
out of the jumping off trenches, out of the first line trenches, into no man's land early in the day while the artillery bombardment was still in progress. The consequence of moving individual units within a division forward into no man's land early is that, first of all, they're doing so before the full light of the day has developed. So they're getting cover from that. Secondly, they are getting the benefit of the cover of the artillery bombardment that is continuing. And thirdly, because the Germans have gone down into deep dugouts while they're under artillery fire, the Germans have less time to get up from deep dugouts to man their defences while the British advance over the remaining parts of no man's land. Comparatively speaking, successes are greater here in the south than they are in the north, for example, at Beaumont Hamel or in that area north of Tiervar. And that takes the British High Command by surprise because they see the road from Albert to Bapome running northeast, the old Roman road, as the natural axis of attack. The fact that success comes on the southeast rather than northeast presents them with a need to adjust in mid-battle. And that's a very difficult thing for them to do because they've been planning this battle for so long. All the forces are weighted in certain ways and communications are extraordinarily slow. On the 1st of July 1916, on the opening day of the battle, neither Henry Rawlinson, the 4th Army commander, nor Douglas Haig, the commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force, have a real idea as to what has happened. It's a long day. It's effectively midsummer. The wounded are lying out in no man's land until it's dark, so till almost midnight. Reports are coming back spasmodically. Only by the 2nd and 3rd of July are they getting an overall perspective on the battlefield, the sense of where there has been success and where there has been failure. Those reports are going to be essential to how they play out the rest of the battle. In the five months of fighting in the Somme battle between the 1st of July 1916 and mid-November 1916, there are recurrent attempts to achieve success in the north, which had been the original direction of the attack. The successes that come are nearly all in the south. That is particularly the case on the 14th of July, when there is a very successful night attack, an unusual thing for the British Army to do, particularly with a volunteer and comparatively inexperienced force close to Longueval. A limited attack, one which surprises Rawlinson, the 4th Army commander, in its success, although he is its author. Broadly speaking, however, the attacks launched by the British in July and August tend to be rushed, ill-prepared and generally unproductive in terms of results. The next big series of successes come in mid-September 1916. Some of these are associated in the minds of the public with the first use of tanks at Flair Corselet on the 15th of September 1916. They are part of a wider success here around Longueval at Flair where there had been successes on the 1st of July 1916. The use of tanks is rudimentary. The tank infantry cooperation is not particularly good. There are still too many attacks being launched with too limited artillery preparation. But it is an army that is learning. And crucially, these attacks are going in before the weather's broken. The end of September is probably the last moment. After that, the rains begin, the days become shorter, the ground turns to mud, and quite frankly, the Somme battle should have been closed down. The Somme battlefield is one fought over continuously between 1914 and 1918. In March 1917, the Germans abandoned these positions, having fought tenaciously in their defence, and the British occupied them essentially without loss of life. In March 1918, the Germans counterattack here and regain this ground. Ground could be won and lost without any decisive effect on the conduct of the war. But what the German attack does do is come very close to the principal railway line, the Amiens railway junction, which is supporting the Allied frontier. And therefore the battle becomes very important defensively. The British interpret it also as a battle designed to divide them from the French, to get them on the pivot between the two armies. The need, therefore, by August, which is when the Allies are able to go over to the counterattack, the need is to clear the railway junction and to do so 
in an area where the Germans are weak. As a result of punching through here, the Germans extended their lines, having shortened them in March 1917, and the price of about 900,000 casualties. They are more vulnerable here, in ground they don't really need to defend anyway, to a counterattack. It is in the interest of the Allies to counterattack here, to secure the railway lines and the railway junctions, to enable the further advance, which will follow in the second half of 1918. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we visit the German cemetery at Freecorps.